Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion, setting forth his sovereignty, and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious Word of Sovereign Grace. Here's this week's message. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would He devote His sacred head for such a worm as I? He loves me, He loves me, He loves me.
42.
Country 23 was selected, and then we'll have time for an opening. 423. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansion, cry and bless it. He'll prepare us a place when we all
Certainly there are times when an individual is uplifted in spirit more than at other times. <clears throat> that is my feelings this morning. That indeed, the Lord has uplifted us in spirit. Psalm service. We've had a very wonderful psalm service this morning, I feel. The Lord's blessed presence has been in our midst. And those of you that failed to, to make it over to the church at Baton Rouge last night, it was a very, very good service. It wasn't a great many of us, but we had a very, very good service. Brother Conley had done some mighty good preaching. <clears throat> this is a new one. And I do trust and hope that the Lord would once again bless us. He would enable us as we turn our thoughts to His Word, as we look at within the fertile fields of the Gospel, that He might enable us to glean a few of the eternal truths that will be helpful and beneficial to us. I feel that in the time that we're living in, that we need to be taught from God's Word more than ever. We need to be taught concerning the principles, the statutes, the judgments, as mentioned to Brother Ronnie and Sister Susan late last night that the standards that God set up for His people to meet and to live by needs to be taught more than ever in this day and age in which we live. And the reason for that, in a way of preliminary remarks, I would just to set this before you. The, way that it, the reason that it needs to be taught more and more is because the more and the more we have, my friends, withdrew or drawn away from those standards. Even in a subtle way, we didn't even realize much of it or many of them that we were leaving. And yet, we have. I was reading an article, and I want to I want to set these few thoughts before you, and uh, before we have a, a public word of prayer, and then the Lord willing, I'll try to preach for you to look into the Word of God. I was reading in some old papers that I managed to find back in the back of the closet last week. And this lady was had written an article in there about what used to be. What used to be. Concerning the church service. And she made reference, she said, now the singing wasn't as good as it used to be because now the church meets and they scatter out over the whole church. And I'm, I, now this is just tradition, really. I mean, it, it has nothing to do with the principles of God, but I, I'm just wanting to set forth before you how things can change, and we don't even give it any thought. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a tradition way, that can change, and more importantly, the principles and, and the standards change also. But anyway, she said, used to as a child, and this lady was born back in the early 1900s, she said, used to, when the church would, would gather, said, said, if we were of a few, said, we would all get in a group to have psalm service. And said, it was no other uh, feeling that you could have other than just uh, enlightened and uplifted in spirit to hear the voices blending together coming from a single group of people. And now, they're scattered all over the church and said, the voices is not blending in as the words. She made many other references, but it kind of caught my attention because I thought of it up at home, of how we're just a very few up there, and, and one's sitting here and one's back there, and I thought, I said, if we were all in a group, we could just have a quartet, you know. <laughs> Maybe it would sound better, I, I don't know. But anyway, uh, brethren, it's very important. I'm not saying the whole tradition hold to tradition. We shouldn't be uh, worried about tradition. But what we're to be worried about is the standard and the principles that God has left on record for us as His children and the sheep of His pasture to hold to and to cling to and to worship God in spirit and in truth as He would have us to worship Him. Pay no attention whether this is the way your grandmother and granddaddy and mama and daddy and brother and sister and, and all of the others, don't pay any attention to whether that is the way they worship or not because 
my friends, we're to be worried about whether it's the way that God says for mm -hmm. us to worship. And so let us have that as the first and foremost priority in our lives. I'm not saying that if, if, if they worship the way that God said it, we shouldn't continue therein. But I'm just simply saying that we, my friends, should study the Word of God to be uh, encouraged along the way to press forward toward the mark of the high calling. And if it, my friends, needs changing, I'm talking about the way that we worship, then let us do that and get it back into the accordance to the will of God. All things that we find recorded in the Word of God concerning God and His worship is yea and amen. And that's the way that it should be. I'm going to ask Brother Kenny, if he would, to lead us in a word of prayer. You pray for me, you pray for one another, that the word of the Lord might have free course. I'm sure there are those that, uh, that have sickness in their families, perhaps they're sick even themselves. Let us ask of God to touch and to heal those who stand in need, and also those that are bereaved and brokenhearted because of the loss of loved ones, because of calamities in life, problems, circumstances beyond our control. All things is easy to God. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. And so let us remember that and ask for God to grant unto us the things that we're standing in God. That was kind and merciful, Heavenly Father. We thank you once again as we pause today for the many blessings you bestowed upon us. Lord, those we realize and those we don't even realize. Lord, we thank you for this place that we have to meet. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that we might worship in a way that would be pleasing in thy sight. Lord, we're thankful for the ones that come here from time to time. Lord, we're thankful that we feel like you've sent them here. We ask this morning that you would continue to supply ministers in the field, Lord, if it be thy will. Lord, we ask this morning that you would be with Brother Jerry as he stands before us. Lord, help him recall those things that he studied. And Lord, may he say, give a message that would be uplifting to each one here, but most of all uplifting to thy great and holy name. Lord, we're, we ask a blessing this morning on those that are sick and afflicted and less fortunate than we are here today. Lord, we ask that you would heal their bodies and their minds if it be thy holy will. Lord, we ask a special blessing on Brother Lonnie. We ask that you would heal his body, Lord, and, and help him get back on his feet as, as quickly as possible. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for everything that you've done for us, and we ask that you would just continue to bless us with the things we stand in need of. Lord, we ask that you bless our families and our children. Lord, lead God and direct them. As, we have, as you would have them to go. Watch over them, Lord, daily. It be thy holy will. Heavenly Father, we're, we ask that you bless those that have lost loved ones recently. Be with them, Lord, and, and help them to, to uh, remember the good times and fill their hearts, Lord, that there would be no room for sorrow. Lord, we, we're so thankful for our song leaders that we have. We ask that you continue to bless Brother Harold and Brother John, as they stand before us, Lord, we're so thankful for them. We, we're thankful for the job that they do. Lord, we, we ask forgiveness for not knowing how to pray, Lord, but we ask that you be with us through the further scenes of this service. May we say or do something here, Lord, that be uplifting to thy name. Forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother King, for your kind, humble prayer. I do appreciate it. <clears throat> Many of you probably don't even know it. don't know how thankful I am for 
for each one of you that are down here. <clears throat> At home, I don't even have an active male member. And unless we have some visitors that will, I leave the same in. Call for the prayers and do the preaching. This church is blessed beyond measure. And I'm thankful that God's blessed me to have a little part in it. It's been an encouragement, an inspiration to me. And I just ask that you remember a little church up in Mississippi. Brother, my, my mind is full of thoughts this morning. From the first words that were spoken at the service in the last night, even to this point, I want to try to speak to you concerning living. If there's such a thing as putting a title to a text, it would be living. We find that there are many people today that are alive, many that are alive spiritually, that are not living. They're merely existing. Christ himself declared that he came that we might have life and the more abundant life. <clears throat> the more abundant life is not having the best of clothes, the best cars and trucks and homes, the best of luxury items, but the abundant life is the better qualities of life happiness and peace and joy, having family and friends, having a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, my friends, the more abundant life, the better qualities of life. And in order to be declared as one that is living, you have to have that in your possession. And the only way that we can have that in our possession is through obedience unto the Lord our God. I made reference in my preliminary remarks earlier concerning the standard or the principles that was given to us and to those that lived thousands of years before our time. Even as God does not change, as Malachi would tell us, even so his principles, his judgments, and his statutes, they don't change either. And it's something that needs to be taught to the Lord's people, and the reason for this is that we have the tendency, or we are prone to be forgetful. We have that tendency to forget things. Have you ever noticed how that you can Tell a child to not do something, and ten minutes later, he'll do it again. And that not only a child, but a young adult, and even a grown person. Have you ever noticed of how that the boss man can, can tell an individual to not be late for work anymore, and the very next day, he's late? It's almost as if it's a direct uh, uh, disobedience there. But yet, that person has uh, that within him that is prone to forget things. And we are prone to forget things also. I'm talking about in the spiritual realm of things. And not only prone to forget, but we have help in forgetting. We have help in forgetting things. And his name is Satan. We find that the Apostle Peter would tell us who in the uh, first Peter, the fifth chapter, the tenth verse, he says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, 
strengthen and settle you. But just prior to that, he tells us that we have an adversary. And his name is the devil. He says, be sober, to be vigilant. Because your adversary. He says he's your adversary. He's your own personal troublemaker. He is as a roaring lion. Have you ever noticed uh, in, in, uh, on, on documentaries in, on the Learning Channel and the Discovery Channel, every once in a while they have a documentary upon lions. And when a lion gets hungry and he gets on what they call the prowl, he won't give up and he won't quit until that hunger is satisfied. He is continuously searching and finding and killing and eating and destroying. And we find that Satan is such an individual as that. He's described as our adversary as a roaring lion, going to survive, seeing a whom that he might devour. He says, therefore, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplishing your brethren that are in the world. We find that the Apostle Paul tells us, for now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. As we turn back over to the Old Testament, we find, my friends, that natural Israel was chosen and given an inheritance of God. Brethren, you have an inheritance today. You have an inheritance that you're going to enter into one day in heaven's pure world. Peter would tell us that this inheritance is uh, incorruptible, it's undefiled, and that it fadeth not away. It's reserved there for you who are kept by the power of God. And my friends, this inheritance is something that you haven't worked for. It's been freely given to you. I want to bring this before you and then we want to look at how that we can enjoy the rewards of that inheritance here in this lifetime. And But my friends, I will say before we get into the further uh, duties and scenes of this service, that, my friends, in order to enjoy those rewards of that inheritance here in time, that the principles and the standards and the judgments and the statutes of God must be met. It must be obedience uh, uh, to the Word of God in order to enjoy that, and we'll prove that just in a few moments over in the Old Testament. But we need uh, to understand, uh, my friend, that natural Israel points uh, to spiritual Israel. What we find as we turn our thoughts over there um, to the book of Deuteronomy, we find that God uh, chose uh, natural Israel and gave them an inheritance. Uh, my friends, they did not do anything at all. Uh, they were not chosen because uh, they were the greatest. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us that they were the fewest. Neither were they chosen because they were the strongest nation. In fact, they were a very weak nation. And neither, my friends, were they chosen because they were so obedient unto the Lord their God. In fact, the Bible tells us that they were a stiff-necked and a rebellious people. Uh, but yet, we find that God uh, chose them because He loved them, and He loved them because He saw them. Oh, my friends, when we think of it, People try to find faults with God. Try to condemn Him. Can you imagine condemning the Lord our God? Can you imagine questioning the authority of God? The Bible says, who hath been His counselor? He doesn't need counseling. He is the great counselor. Who hath given him wisdom? God is wisdom. And who hath lended God power? The Bible says that he is power and he's sovereign. And so we find that he loved natural Israel because he's sovereign and he chose them because of that love and he brought them into a good land, a very fertile land. 
He brought them, my friends, into a land that when the spies were sent over before they actually entered in to the promised land or to the Canaan's land, that they sent spies over to see how things was over there. And to, for us to understand of just how fertile that this land is, and it's still amazing to me because from time to time I'll go into the grocery store and I'll pick up a what's called a bunch of grapes or a cluster of grapes and I'll put it in a little bag that you tear off of the roll there and you can tote it out in with just one finger. But here we find that when the spies came back from the land of Canaan from looking over there, they brought something with them as proof of the fertility of the land, of how fertile and how abundant that God's blessings was over there. They brought a cluster of grapes that was so large that it had to be placed upon a staff and carried or bore between two men on their shoulders. And that's just amazing to me. But yet what it is is showing the power and the sovereignty and the providence of God. That nothing is too hard for the Lord. But He brought them into this land and He gave it to them as an inheritance. Of the twelve tribes, Levin was given a, 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 a certain part of that uh, land. We'll turn over for a moment and we'll find this in the book of, of Deuteronomy. We'll find it, I believe, in the 32nd chapter. We find here in the 32nd chapter, beginning in the 8th verse, he said, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Now, of the 12 tribes, my friends, God gave an inheritance. He set the bounds of the people to 11 of those tribes. Now, of the tribe of Levi, there was no inheritance given, but my friends, they had no land to till. They were not given inheritance, but they, my friends, were to be given from the other level. The other level was to give to them. And so therefore, we find that the other eleven was given an inheritance there, and as long as they kept the commandments and the judgments and the statutes of God, as long as, if you go over and read the first chapter of Isaiah, you'll find this. He says that if ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Now here is a promise with authority. Here is authority given. Here's a commandment. Here we find two roads. We find two avenues. One leadeth unto life or living, and the other leads to death or destruction. Plain and simple. Remember, God does not change His principles does not change his statutes, his commandments. What God expects out of his people does not change. The same things that was given to natural Israel according to their inheritance. Remember, natural Israel points toward spiritual Israel. The church today is a type of the Canaan's land or the promised land that natural Israel was given. The church is an inheritance to the Lord's people. What we find here is that God told natural Israel, those that, was, had, in, had, that had inherited the Canaan's land, that if ye be willing and obedient, then I'm going to allow you to eat the good of the land. You're going to be able to cut the cluster of grapes and to eat, partake of it and to eat it. When you plant the seed, the ground is fertile. It's going to bring forth uh, the, the grain. It's going to bring forth whatever that you plant. And you're going to have plenty. Notice, he says, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds. God gave each one just exactly what they needed. 
Here we find the wisdom and the sovereignty of God, my friends, in action. God set the bounds. No one said, look, Lord, we need more than this. God gave to them exactly what they did. He had the wisdom to know. Remember, God can see the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that have not yet been known, saying, my counsel shall stand. God set the bounds according to the number of the children of Israel. Now I want you to notice something else here. For the Lord's portion is His people, and Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. <clears throat> now the Lord's people have an inheritance. But the Lord has an inheritance also. He just told you who they are. You, my friends, are the Lord's inheritance. But I want you to notice something else here. We find two things here that's made reference to. We find the word portion and we find the word lot. If we were going to have lunch here today and someone had a cake back there or a pie and they asked me, said, Brother Jerry, would you care for a portion of this cake? And I agreed to it that yes I would, and I walked back there, I would be expecting one, two, maybe three slices if I'm greedy. But one portion, one piece is what would be under consideration. But if someone asked me, Brother Jerry, would you like the lot of this cake? Not a lot, the lot. You know what I'd be expecting? The whole thing. Whole cake. Notice what he's telling us here. Remember the words, not for they are not all Israel that are of Israel. Remember that quotation? For well, here he tells us, for the Lord's portion is his people. Not all the people in the world belongs unto the Lord. The Lord's portion is his people. And Jacob, which is a tie and a shadow of, of, of you and me, of every one of us. Remember, the Lord found Jacob. He found him in a desert land and in a waste tower and wilderness. He instructed him. He led him about. He kept him in the apple of his eye. He caused him to eat the fat of the lamb and drink the pure blood of the grape. And all of these other things, my friends, Jacob, which is a tie of, of, of the Lord's people, Jacob, uh, in all of the Lord's people is represented in Jacob. Here we find the Lord's portion is His people and Jacob is the lot of His inheritance. All of God's people are represented here in Jacob. He's not going to lose a single one. We are the Lord's inheritance and my friends, we have an inheritance in heaven. This inheritance that we are looking forward to one day is undefiled, it's incorruptible, and that it fadeth not away. Now you tell me of any inheritance. Brethren, this is good news to me. I suppose that's what upsets me so many times when I see the Lord's people so unconcerned about going to church and about knowing more about this old book here and about the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, we are saying that we want to know nothing about our inheritance. Probably if we got a letter or a phone call this afternoon that said you've been uh, incorporated in somebody's will and that you have an inheritance from this individual, if they said meet us at 8 in the morning, we'd probably be there at 7 and because we'd want to know what have we got. Here we have an inheritance and brethren, I want to know more and more and more about that inheritance. In fact, the Bible tells us that we're not only heirs of God, but joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. If I had a wife, or some of you that do have wives, if you have a bank account and you go up there to that bank and you put a thousand dollars in that bank account,
And you are equal owners of that bank account. That means that you have, the husband has 500 and the wife has 500. You're equal. But if you're joint heirs, that means that you have a thousand, that thousand belongs unto you, and that thousand belongs unto her. It's a difference. It's not co-heirs, it's not equal heirs, but it's joint heirs, my friends. Whatever that belongs unto the Lord belongs unto you, and that which belongs unto you belongs unto the Lord. This is that which is to come. And that every one that is incorporated within that will, and rather, uh, just very briefly, I want to set forth before you that in, to inherit something or to become an heir, you never ever do anything to get in that. Never. How foolish do you think people would look at us or look at me if I went out tomorrow to someone's home and said, look, what, what things can I do for you that will make you put me in your will? I want to be in your will, and I want to do some things to get put in that will. You just don't do it. That will, my friends, is according to the sovereignty of that individual according to his own wisdom and his own power and his own sovereignty, that individual incorporates you within his will. It's no different with God. No different. The individual is passive. It's kind of like this Bible here. This Bible has been translated from the Greek and the Hebrew. It's been changed to the English verse. Well, this book here, in these words, they didn't have one thing to do with that translation. They didn't have one thing to do with that change that come about. There were individuals, there were men that changed that. It was an active a part upon one and a passive upon another. Brethren, we as individuals, as heirs of God, we were passive in the writing of the will, and God, my friends, was active. You've probably heard me say there are several different ways that you can be written into or become an heir or incorporated in, uh, to, to an inheritance. One is by your birthright. You can be born into a family and become an heir. We've been born into the family of God when it pleased God, uh, to, uh, uh, my friends, uh, uh, to, to pour us of His Spirit. And then you can be adopted uh, into a family. And my friends, uh, an individual that is adopted into that family is just as much uh, uh, an heir of that uh, inheritance as the one that was born into it. There's no difference. They have every legal right. They have every aspect of it that any one of the others uh, has. And also, uh, my friends, you can marry into a family and become an heir. You're married to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're his bride. And then you can be named in a will. You can be just written in because of the sovereignty. My friends, your names have been written into the Lamb's Book of Life. And not only written, but they've been engraved there. And that inheritance is reserved for you. And you're being kept by the power of God. One day, you're going to my friends when it pleases God at the last uh, uh, trump at the sound at when at the at the last sound of the last trump, my friends, when God declares for time to be no more, we're going to be carried home and we're going to receive the full fruits of that inheritance. But right today, we're talking about enjoying the rewards of that inheritance. Just as natural Israel had to meet certain criteria. Just as certain as they had to meet certain demands of God in order to enjoy the Canaan's land, 
Even so, we do too. It hasn't changed. People want to know what is the big problem in society today. People uh, oftentimes talk about the children. The principles have not changed one hour. You turn over to the Apostle Paul's writings in the church at Ephesus, you'll find that he says in the 6th chapter, he says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children unto wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Parents oftentimes uh, uh, talk to the ministry, they talk uh, to counselors, they talk to other individuals in questioning what is wrong with my children. They simply won't mind. And when you begin to talk and discuss the matters with them about of how that they've been uh, their raising, of how they've been uh, brought up, uh, were they taken to church, were they uh, uh, brought up in love and compassion and, and in humbleness? No. Well, what can we expect? Brethren, the Bible tells us that if we want our land healed, then we've got to turn our thoughts, our minds, our hearts, and our souls under the Lord. Just as natural Israel was taught that you uh, uh, you be willing and obedient and you'll eat the good of the land, but if you refuse and rebel, then you're going to be devoured by the sword. Here we have living and dying. And my friends, I'm uh, 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 so worried from time to time and so upset uh, that uh, there are more dying than there are those living. And it's something for us to think about here in this life. We have this inheritance. We can enjoy the rewards of it. All my friends, I brought to your attention as we started in Peter of our adversary for one purpose only. As I told the church, last Sunday down at Forest, Mississippi. If everyone that was there and everyone that was here today, everyone that's here, if you will be honest with yourself, you don't have to tell anybody, but if you'll be honest, I could almost guarantee you and say it'll be true. Every one of us thought of some reason not to come today. I'm tired, yes. Many of you are tired. Some of you are sick. Some of you don't feel good. There's a lot of things. Grass needs cutting. I brought before you the point that we have an adversary for the simple reason, my friends, we have help in forgiving. And his name is Satan. Satan, my friends, works upon the minds of individuals. People go over and they read in the book of Job. They read of how that, that uh, Satan took everything that Job had. He took his wife, his sons, his daughters. He took his cattle, his oxen, his silver, his gold, everything that he had, and even took his health. He struck him down where he was sitting at the gate, scraping the sores uh, that had uh, afflicted his body from the sole of his feet to the top of his head. When we think of Satan uh, interfering with us, we think of him, of how, my friends, that he makes us sick. But that is not the case. I'm not saying that he can't do that. If God gives him the authority to afflict our natural bodies with sickness, I'm not saying that he can't do that, but it's only when God gives him the ability. But my friends, I want you to understand that Satan works most of the time in the mind. The mindset of God's people. I want you to understand that the mind controls everything. The mind controls the emotion. The mind controls the words. The mind controls the deeds. It controls everything about us. Our thoughts originate in our minds. Satan works in our minds, my friends. And if you turn here to the Word of God, notice what he done to Eve. Notice. 
We'll, we'll go there just for a split second. Notice what Satan done to Eve. He's looking at the fruit. It looked good. Fruit to be desired. Can you imagine her looking at that piece of fruit? Go ahead. Take a bite. I can't do that. God said if we partake of that, we'll die. You won't die. Most surely you won't die, but you'll become as God's doing good and evil. What was he working on? He was sowing the seed of doubt, my friend, within her mind. He was working upon her mind. When God told uh, Jonah to arrive and to go down uh, to Nineveh and to preach to those people, Satan was working on his mind, wasn't he? He tried to flee from the presence of God. How foolish can we be? But isn't it something that we all tried to do? In one way or the other? In one way or the other, whether we like to admit it or will admit it or not, we've all tried to flee from the presence of God from time to time. It don't matter where we at. We're at home. We're at church. We're at work. Ball game, fishing trip, reunion. I mean, brethren, it don't matter wherever that we're at. It's kind of like the brother uh, mentioned last night that he was so thankful that the Lord ascended back into heaven that the Comforter might come because if he happeneth that as long as Jesus was here upon the earth, that he could only be in one place at one time. But after that, he had ascended back to heaven, and then the Holy Spirit was come, that he was everywhere all the time. And I'm thankful for that. That the Lord can be here with us this morning, and that he can be up at our union meeting with the family and the brethren and sisters at the same time, Brother Dexter. At the same very time. He can be bringing comfort to a family that's lost a loved one and also healing a sick individual over here in the hospital. All at the same time. I'm thankful for that this morning. And brethren, we can enjoy these rewards if we meet the criteria. It's no if and ands about it. It's this way or no way. Satan says, do it your way. Remember the song that was put out by a man that they say is still alive and he's been dead years and years. I did it my way. Elvis Presley. Yes, he did it his way. And we see where it got him. We see where he's at. The drugs, the alcohol, everything else. It destroyed his life naturally. It destroyed him. But yet we find recorded in the Bible that those that Satan works upon their mind said, you say, well, why are you bringing this to our attention? We're here at church this morning. My friends, the Apostle Paul declares it with much and he affirms it with great authority and uh, great admonition uh, for us. And brethren, it's something for us to stop and to, and to give careful consideration to. He says, take heed. He says, uh, let me get the correct quotation. He says, he that thinketh he standeth, take heed. Pay attention to this. He that thinketh he standeth, take heed. Lest he fall. Lest he fall. Why? We have an opposition. We have one that's going to place doubts there. We have one that's going to work upon the mindset of man. 
My friends, I want you to understand this morning that just as uh, the Bible here tells us that God led him about in reference to Jacob, He instructed him, He blessed him beyond measure, someone worked upon the mindset. Why? When I say that, notice what He says. But Jerusalem waxed fat and kicked. And he forsook God, which made him and lightly esteemed. That means he gave little regard to the one of his salvation. Now here was an individual. Brother, I want you to think of this. You remember over in, in one of the four Gospels we find these words it says, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired you that he might sift you as wheat. And here we find a man by the name of Simon Peter, one that had walked hand in hand with the Lord Jesus Christ. He had witnessed the miracles. He had witnessed all of these other things. He had even witnessed the miracle of Christ in his own life as he walked contrary to nature across the water. And then when the Lord, when he took his eyes off the Lord and he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me or I perish, the Lord delivered him from a watery grave. He had witnessed all of these things, and yet Satan, my friends, was after him. Here was a man that had enjoyed all of these things. Here was a man, imagine in your life, to bring it to a personal note, imagine this. You're in a far country, no money, no food, you're very hungry, you have no friends, you're a total stranger, you can't speak the language, and you're out there wandering. And someone comes along, they feed you, they clothe you, give you something to drink, they take care of you. They learn you the language. They instruct you. And they put you in the way to civilization. And when you get there, you totally forget that stranger. You don't never cross your mind. You would have died out there if left alone. You'd have literally died. This is what happened. Notice what he said. The Lord found him in a desert land and in a waste hiring wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He even kept him. He watched over him, brethren. He kept him as the apple of his eye as the apple of his eye. And notice this, as an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young. You know why the eagle stirs up her nest? She puts down, she puts feathers in the box. You've ever had a, a, a down in coat or a sleeping bag? It's soft and it's warm. It's real comfortable. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, she stirs up that nest to make it light and fluffy for the young ones. This is what God has done for Jacob. This is what God has done for you and for me. He stirred it up and He's made the, he's made the travel and a comfortable place. Here He says, he, As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, She's covering them with her wings. Remember the old song that we can that, he, uh, that we can hide under the shadow of his wings. Here we find that the eagle spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh, taketh him up, and beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone, by himself, so the Lord alone did lead. There was no strange God with him. He made him to ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock. 
and all out of the fleeing rock. Butter of kine and milk of sheep with the fat of lambs and rounds of the breed of the shine and goats. And thou didst drink the pure blood of the grave. So Jerusalem waxed fat, kick. Thou art waxing fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. I want to read these other few. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begot thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Of the rock that begot thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Brethren, we are an inheritor to the Lord. And the Lord has given us an inheritance. And we can enjoy the rewards of that inheritance here in time. To enjoy, my friends, is to live the abundant life. To have the peace, the happiness, the joy. We find here those that, my friends, enjoy that. I want to turn over and read you something here. You say, does it make a difference? I want to read you something in the book of Luke. This is the sum total of the whole thing. Recorded in the book of Luke, the sixth chapter, I want to read you this. Beginning in the 47th verse. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, Remember, the Bible tells us to be not only a hearer of the word, but also a doer. Remember Jeremiah where he tells us, Stand ye in the ways, and see and ask for the old paths, and walk therein. You see the criteria that's got to be met? It never changes. It's always the same. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You've got to come unto me. Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Then you've got to walk therein. Here he tells us, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, this is what the Lord says about you. You want to know what the Lord thinks about you? Here it is. Whosoever cometh unto me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will shew unto you whom he is like. And this is what the Lord thinks about you. Remember, the Lord knows what you're doing. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're saying. And this is what he says about you. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock and when the flood arose, the streams beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Now if you cometh unto him and heareth his sayings and doeth them, this is what the Lord sees you as, as a man that has built a house where you dug deep and laid a foundation uh, that was solid as a rock. But on the other hand, the flip side of this, but he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house. I know all of you probably, or many of you, have been down on the beach. And you built a little sand stove, a little sand castle. You built something out of sand. About the time you get through with it, there comes a wave in, and it just takes it right back out with it. And all the hard work is gone. That's the way it is with us in life. If we don't have a solid foundation, 
when the trials and the tribulations come, when Satan presses us sore, when he fires the fiery darts, when he hurls the fiery darts upon us, my friend, it shakes our faith. It places doubts and fears within us if our house is not built upon a solid foundation, he says to him that heareth and doeth not, I'm going to liken you unto a man that built a house that had no foundation and when the winds come and the rain fell and the rain come and the wind blew, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. The ruin of that house was great. It was destroyed. So it is with our life. Brethren, we have an inheritance. It's ours. It's yours. It's reserved in heaven. God made the reservation for you. I didn't make it. The gospel didn't make it. You didn't make it. No group of men made it. Brethren, God made that reservation for you. It'll never be corrupted. Think about it. Some of you may have uh, money stored up, leaving for your kids. Just think how easy that inheritance can be corrupted. Just think of how easy, because of a small technicality, that inheritance can fade away. This inheritance will never be defiled, it will never be corrupted, and it will never fade away. It's reserved there in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. Brethren, you can have a foretaste of it. We're receiving the earnest of our inheritance right now. Not the inheritance, but the earnest. If I go tomorrow to buy a new car and I put money down on it and deposit it for them to hold it, that's earnest money. You know, that, that's something that, you know, that I hold that day. My friends, we're receiving the earnest of our inheritance. We, we can receive the rewards of that inheritance right here today. Whether we receive it or not, it's left up to us. God bless you. Pray for me. Consider these words. Brethren, the subject of inheritance, I've only touched upon it. I've only just scratched the surface. Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.